almost done worked up a sweat. Huh? Oh, Lord. Don't get me started, Judas. Behave. We went and ate uh, Mexican. I was going to say Chinese, but Ray and Judy won't go eat Chinese. Uh, we went and ate Mexican, and we ate, and we ate. I don't know how many baskets of uh, chips. chips we went through. We told that guy we had a hole in the bottom of ours. He needed to fix that hole so it wouldn't empty quite as fast, but it didn't help. But, uh, so then to top that off, Jacob can't hear me, uh, but Jacob got a churro. Is that what you call that thing? It, 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 close enough. Cheerios, that's right. Cheerio won't chum you. <laughs> but anything, anyway, that thing come out in this big old wine looking glass thing. About the, and the glass about this big, about that full of ice cream. And, and that much more um, uh, whipped cream on it. And had all these little Cheerios sticking in it. And all of a sudden, the guy comes to me, anybody else want one? <laughs> well, Esther said, that looks good. So it, it was Jacob's fault. We blame it on Jacob. He's not in here to defend himself. So, so anyway, we decided to get one. I said, I just want a couple bites. And then uh, actually you decided to get one first. Ray and Judy got one. And then Jennifer got one to go. And so and she says, that just sort of looks good. And I look back and I says, bring one more of here. <laughs> I'm stuffed to the gills. Lord have mercy. The only good thing about today, uh, Gail, is my throat ain't sore like it was last time. Because I, I couldn't get hardly two words out. and Y'all remember that last year. But uh, I want to sing about three songs. I gave the praise team a, a break today, my, my band. I appreciate uh, Paul and Annette and Colin and Yvonne. And they do such a wonderful job. And, and appreciate it. Really. <laughs> we decided to start doing a little bit of music. Just to kind of set the tone before the words brought. And so I appreciate their faithfulness to that. And I've learned a lot. We were talking about that yesterday. We've learned a lot from it. From Annette Hat we have on. <laughs> and uh, she's very talented. And, and so I, I bring music in with chords on it. And she says, that just don't sound right. I said, well, what is it supposed to be? And we'll sit there and figure it out. And we get it figured out. But uh, thank you, Annette, for everything you do. I want to do this old song. Most of you know I grew up in church. And I remember uh, going and staying at my great-grandmother's house. Anybody know anything about Greenville where uh, Roper Mountain Road crosses 85? Yeah. That whole area's changed now with the Gateway Project. But anyway... That, all that property where Rover Mountain goes across was Wilson property. It was my great-grandmother's. And then, so when you come through there going uh, north on 85, on the right side, there's a brick building there now, but my grandfather's house was there. And he owned the woods across the street of, across Rover Mountain Road. On the other side, there's storage units. That was my great-grandmother's home. And across the street from her was my dad's two uncles. So dad's got all the eight millimeter film shooting out across a, a, a field. I said, well, dad, what's that? He says, oh, 85 goes through there now. I'm like, man. But uh, I go stay with my great grandmother. And uh, dad played bass in a gospel group for years. And uh, I, I knew all the songs. And so I bring my old little record player over. Yeah, I'm old enough to have a record player. Some, some don't know what that is now. That's a big mini disc. <laughs> well, that's a big disc player. But anyway, uh, I, uh, I'd take my record player and the two albums they did, and I would find me a pencil or something, uh, a wooden spoon or something, and I'd sit there and I'd sing, feel like I was singing to a thousand people. And uh, my great-grandmother, she, she was almost 102 when she passed away. She was two weeks from being 102 when she passed away. Home be the Lord. But she'd say, she'd slap my face, felt like it was going across the room. She'd say, that's my old preacher boy. And, uh, of course, I like to sing. I'm not really a preacher, but like I said this morning, the Lord's put this on my heart. I'm going to share it with you. But uh, I think about my great-grandmother. And uh, I can tell you all kinds of stories. My, this true story, my favorite one was when we got old enough, we'd go sleep in the room next door to her room. There were, uh, her, her parents' pictures were on the wall. <laughs> Wherever you went in the room, then pictures went. <laughs> and I had to tell her, Granny, please hide that. And she'd say, let moan now. That was her thing. Let moan, then pictures ain't going to body. And I'd just throw the cover up my head. I'd go to sleep somehow. Then things would scare the dickens out of me. But when I sing this song, I think about my great-grandmother uh, who's, who's in heaven. I'm fifth-generation Pentecostal. And so I can remember uh, hearing the stories of my great-grandmother telling us things of how it used to happen here in the upstate, you know, when Pentecost first hit here. Everybody knows Pentecost hadn't been around forever. And uh, so I can remember her telling stories about that. But I want to say it's an old song. I'm going to sing it for you today. My mama read 
a story from the Bible long ago about Shadrach, Meshach, and old Abednego. How the wicked king commanded they be thrown into the flame because they would not bow and deny their father's name. Mama said the king stood high upon a balcony so tall. When he looked in, he was shocked by all the things he saw. When he thought that he would find them lying dead upon the ground. But instead of three, he counted four of them walking all around. Then I said, Mama, wait a minute. There's one thing that I must know. If three went in, three came out, then where did the fourth man go? And I never forget it. Mama danced across the floor. These are the words I heard her say while shouting through the door. She said he's still in the fire and he's walking in the flames and he'll be there to help you when you call upon his name. And he can still deliver by his almighty power while hearing all it's good to know he's still in the fire. I said he's still in the fire and he's walking in Life's hottest flames, but I'm glad that I can tell you through the power of his name. Not one flame of fire will touch you, you'll come through it all to tell. Yesterday, today, forever, God is still alive and well. I said, He's still in the fire, and He's walking in the flames, and He'll be there to help you when you call upon His name. And He can still deliver by His almighty power. It's good to know he's still in the fire. While here below, it's good to know he's still in the fire. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That's an old song there. It's even muffled sounding. It's so old. I can't get it to sound digital anymore. <laughs> I can lift a finger and start sweating, y'all. So y'all just have to forgive me on that. I brought that table in here. It felt like I had a big workout a while ago. And that thing's light as a feather. But uh, I don't know. You like that one? Yeah. We need to learn that? Well, maybe we can. Maybe we can. You just have to know my great-grandmother, though. It's about like your grandmother tell you, you got to get on the blood, Donnie. You got to get on Every one of us can stand up here and say, my great-grandmother, my grandmother, my mom and my dad, somebody in our past put us on the right path. You know, maybe we didn't go at the right at the beginning there, but somewhere along the way we did it. You know? uh, this next song I want to do is, uh, pastors preached on this several times, and, and I had the special, man, if I'd have just known how to sing this. But, um, friends of mine wrote this song years back, and it talks about... Jonathan. Everybody knows the story of Doc Jonathan and David. And you know how they became best buds, basically best friends. The Bible says where one went, the other one went. And just to make a long story short, you know, David becomes king eventually. And he and Jonathan made a blood covenant one another. They wouldn't forget each other. Y'all remember that story? They met out in the field. They made a blood covenant. They wouldn't forget each other. David becomes king. And I can imagine he's thinking about his friend Jonathan. And the thing you have to remember is Jonathan was found in Lodibar. And I can't remember what the interpretation is, but basically I call Odebar the wrong side of the wrong side of the tracks. Place of barrenness. Thank you. That's right. That's right. And uh, so he was hidden away. The laws had changed. He should have been dead. By all legal rights, he should have been dead. But he was hiding away, probably in fear of his life. And David remembers his covenant he made with Jonathan. He starts inquiring, is there anybody left in the house of Saul? I made a covenant with my best friend Jonathan. Is there anybody? And they start telling him, there's one of uh, Jonathan's sons. He, he survived. He, now, he's crippled on his feet because of a fall he took, but he's down in the barn. He says, go get him and bring him back to me. And you know, the story it says they restored everything back to him. But that's what this song is right here. <laughs> Is 
Is there anyone left from the house of Saul that I might show kindness for Jonathan's sake? He was my best friend when we were but young. If there's one left, go find him before it's too late. The servant said, Lord, I have good news. There is still one living just across Jordan. He is Jonathan's son. But as he fled from the kingdom, he fell in the street. And because of this fall now, he is lame on his feet. David said, go find him. So the servant went away. Later brought him in to face the king. They were so afraid, expecting they would find the king filled with malice and vile. Instead, the king had mercy when they saw David smile. You see, there was a covenant between your father and me. Sealed with blood, it shall remain for eternity. Though the law says you must die, make no mistake. I am here to give you life for Jonathan's sake. sings as Rich Mullins songs. But Rich Mullins inspires Paul. And I like to hear him when he sings them. You know, or he'll say, you know, we did this song years ago and, and I just want to sing it for you. We all have our stories. The, honestly, good, this song here, I'd never heard it before. And we had the opportunity to go see the Gaithers where I used to work. We had one of those nice suites in the Bilo Center. And uh, we went to sing the Gaithers that time. And this group was up there singing this song and I would never heard of them before. You know, and I told Esther, I said, I got to go find that song because they were bringing the house down with it. I'm just telling you. There's always one group comes in and they'll just tear the whole place apart. And if they don't want to raise their hands or do anything, you know, they give them the little lights. To... <laughs> but this song, man, I'm telling you, it's just, it's a powerful song. And I don't know if you're going through anything tonight, but I'm telling you what, he'll meet us where we're at. He's, he promised he'd never leave us nor forsake us. And uh, so this is for some who may, maybe you're going through something tonight. I hope this will bless you. Then I'm going to get the word here. So many times I've questioned certain circumstances, things I could not understand. Everybody been there probably, right? Many times in trials, weakness blurs my vision. My frustration gets so out of hand. But it's then I am reminded 
right here in this book. I've never been forsaken. see the doctor and it's been so long I'm 47 right now it's probably I was 40 or 41 probably since I went last time I guess <laughs> and I remember the doctor he come in they, they couldn't even get drops of my eyes I can't stand drops of my eyes the doctor had to put a put a put me in a choke cold <laughs> drops of my eyes literally <laughs> and he, but uh, he, he got him in thankfully <laughs> but uh, I told him he says what do you have a problem and I said uh I said, I just, you know, I sit at the computer all day, and I said, I'm just, my eyes, I get home, everything's fuzzy. He says, well, Stan, he says, that's just part of getting old. I said, no, not me. <laughs> and it's just gradually done that through the years. I, I mean, I look at three computer screens now all day long. Not one, but one. I graduated to two, and now to three. And now they're looking at us, even though we had a big meeting this week, they're talking about, well, we want to help out the employee experience. Now they're talking about where I work right now. Um, they're talking about putting these desks in that if you want to stand up a little bit, you can raise your desk. Yeah. And, yeah. 
some of them already got it. People that have really bad problems with their hips and knees, and I'm thinking, boy, I'd like to get my hands on one of those. But uh, it is what it is. Turn, it will, turn, if you will, tonight to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I opened this up to get water and didn't get any, did I? Oh, you got it? Yeah. When you, amen. She said, Gail's got it. <laughs> I'm only reading from the NIV, so um, I know a lot of folks don't, a lot of folks like the King James, nothing wrong with that. Some use the New King James. I just found this version to be very good for this particular passage of Scripture. And uh, everybody there? All right. First Corinthians chapter 3, we'll start at verse 12. It says, if anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder, excuse me, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through flames. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask you the next few moments, Lord, to just minister in a mighty way. Lord, let me be hit behind the cross tonight, Jesus. Open our hearts and our ears to receive from you tonight, Lord. And we'll give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Everybody says, Amen. All through the Bible, we see the use of fire, do we not? We, uh, I assume uh, the Bible just talks about in the beginning that God, He sacrificed animals to give Adam and Eve their skins. I assume He burned an offering. Ray and I were talking about this. God had to come up, He must have been the creator of fire. What? No man rubbing two sticks together. That's just the way I see it. But the wood, the, the, we burn wood for the sacrifice for the remission of sins. The Lord showed Himself to Moses in a burning bush. I mean, we know it wasn't literally burning, but He showed Himself in a burning bush. The Lord came as a pillar of fire by night for the Israelites. A fire was used for purification. We read that in several places in the Bible. Tongues of fire. Acts chapter 2, tongues of fire. Fire fell on those in the upper room. And it seems that God always showed Himself by fire throughout this whole book. It just seems like that. I mean, anywhere you, you, you read about God showing Himself, uh, it always seems by fire or smoke and lights, it seems like. I don't mean that in a rude sense. But even with Moses on, on, on the mountain, you know, and, and so the people down below, all they heard was rumbling and thunder and lightning. So that kind of tells me maybe Moses was in the presence of, of fire. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not a Bible scholar, and I'm not going to get into debate with that tonight. But we as Pentecostals, we're Pentecostal believing church, right? If you come here regularly, you know you're going to hear tongues, you're going to hear shouting, you're going to see jumping and shouting or running around or something to know that in our worship we're Pentecostal in what we believe. And there's nothing wrong with that. I tell you, some of the best service I've ever been in was Baptist churches. You feel such a sweet spirit. So everybody's got their own way of worshiping. But I want to look at, at this tonight that we're, uh, we want a revival to hit. And everybody says, oh, when, when revival hits, the true fire of God's going to fall. And, and we can say that's true to a certain extent, but there's something more that has to come with that fire. And that's what I want to talk to you tonight. That what makes up something a little different for our fire is the fact that if I have the fire of God, how many build fires in your fireplaces? Or you'd like to have fires outside or something? How many know that you can't get a good fire if you ain't got one? Wood. Kindling's one thing. Wood, that's right. You ain't got good firewood, it ain't going to burn a lick, is it? And so that's what I'm talking about. In order to have a good burning fire, we've got to have wood. And I brought some samples tonight. Now, uh, Roy brought these two to me right here. You said this was, well, it's wet now, but it's dry oak. And this was white pine. And I found that out a little early, trying to be careful and still have that nasty stuff on my hands. But we'll talk about that in just a minute. Let me give that same scripture if I can. I want you to look, look at that same scripture again. You don't have this translation, but this is another translation called the message translation. It reads this way with that same four verses we just read. Take particular care in picking out your building materials. Eventually, there's going to be an inspection. If you use cheap or inferior materials, 
you'll be found out. The inspection will be thorough and rigorous. You won't get by with a thing. If your work passes inspection, fine. If it doesn't, your part of the building will be torn out and started over. But you won't be torn out. You'll survive, but just barely. So I want to look at this about burning fire, burning wood. I am not a fire starter by no means. Y'all want to know how I like to start a fire? Deer of flame. <laughs> we'll go camping and I'll pay three bucks for them little homemade things that have sawdust and something else in them with a wig on them. Crank that baby up and then put your wood on it. Man, you're going to get a fire one way or another. <laughs> Oh, but I love, I, I love to sit around the fire. We have a fire pit in the house and hadn't used it in quite some time. Matter of fact, our, we took our, uh, our canopy off our swing because every time wind blows, it acts like the sail and falls over. So about a year ago, the swing took a, took a, a sail and landed on the fire pit. And it kind of sits crooked now. And she says, you're doing new one. I thought about bringing a fire pit here tonight. I knew I'd get something out of you on that. Not to necessarily start a fire, but just kind of throw some wood in it and show you. you know? <laughs> Putting everything in, in, in this aspect, seeing it, that fire burns through and in us, we make up the fire. We make up the wood that has to make the fire of God fall. Fire of God's just not going to fall. That's right. We hear pastor talk about all the time. Revival starts right here. That's right. Okay? And so I'm going to tell you a little bit more on, on, on some of that. But th thinking of it in that aspect, we must realize that we are the wood of the fire. And so I want to look at some different things tonight about the different types of wood. Now, I did Boy Scout, or, or not Boy Scouts, but if Justin could come down here, he's an Eagle Scout. And he could tell us all about building a fire, what type of wood to use, what type of sticks to use. Oh, you down by the river? Go get me some of this and it'll light up good. Or get these two pieces, they're probably rough to be an Eagle Scout rubbing sticks together, I'm sure. I can't do that. I'd be like, uh, I love Andy Griffith. I would be like, uh, and you remember when Barney and uh, Gomer get lost in the woods? Y'all remember that one? And Andy comes finding him and he breaks off some, he just takes these matches and breaks them off. Because Barney done got tired of doing this, no fire. And Andy comes by and, and, and uh, gives these matches to Gomer. He says, break off them, put them down there and get them to rub it a little more. And so he does. And when he rubs it, all of a sudden, whoosh, a fire starts in that little thing. And, you know, and, and, and Barney just thinks he's just the man of the hour. Being, you know, it's just hilarious. I could go on and on about Andy Griffith. But the one thing we have to start out with the fire is the first step of it is we've got to have tinder. You can't just take a log and put a match on it and think it's going to light. That's right. Man, don't that ring sound good? We might as well take our time. We're in here for a while tonight, it sounds like. Nah, it'll pass. It'll pass. Thank you for coming out in the rain tonight. I know it's... Some of you probably got drenched coming in. The rain wasn't too bad coming in, but, but the Lord will let it pass and we'll get out of here just in time. I'm sure right after it ends. Tinder is an easily combustible material used to start a fire. Types of tinder used. I brought a little bit just to show you. Pine needles. Got a few pine needles here. They do burn good. Uh, dry leaves, some little dry little twigs and stuff will burn good. I, the best thing I have ever found is dryer lint. If you ever want to try to start a fire, get you some dryer lint. Okay? Yes, it, it's, it'll burn like you wouldn't believe. Don't do it in your house, though. Okay? Don't do it on the floor. Do it in your fireplace or outside. Uh, I'll clean this mess up, so don't worry about all this, please. <laughs> needles, pine needles, leaves, cloth, lint, frayed rope, paper are some of the types of, of tinder that we use. But unfortunately, what I see in tender is once you light it and leave it right there, what's going to happen to it? It will burn out. That's right. It will burn out quickly. And when we think of it in the, in the aspect of the fire of God, tender, this is why I see tender. It's those people that go to church to get their fix until the next time they feel they need something. It may, I call some of them CEOs, Christmas and Easter only. Maybe Mother's Day and Father's Day, possibly, but Christmas and Easter only are a lot of them people. 
But it may be something that's happened in their lives. Maybe a sickness. Maybe they had a, a disease or loss of job or they need financial help. I'm not saying they come to church to actually get the help, but they'll come to church and shed a few tears and come to the altar and ask somebody to pray for them and then if the Lord meets their needs, you never see them again until the next time they need something else from the Lord. God, if you'll help me this way, I'll serve you. And then all of a sudden, they get what they need and they're gone. You don't see them no more. I call people like that tender. And I'm not pointing fingers at anybody in here, but I do want you to see the relationship in this and the fact that there are all kinds of people in churches like this. In every type of wood that I'm going to mention tonight, we fit into one of these four categories. Whether you want to believe it or not, we fit into one of these four categories. <clears throat> Just like tender, we catch fire real easy only to burn out as soon as we move away from the fire or His presence. I've got it. i got what I need. So I don't need to come to church no more. And two weeks later, we're right back in the same place where we were two weeks prior. Let me look at number two here real quick. I, I, told, I, I told someone it wouldn't be too long. And Esther told me she was going to throw the five-minute sign up on me if I went too long tonight. So I've got about 26 minutes by my watch. So i got to hurry. <laughs> Last time I went an hour and 20 minutes, didn't realize it. Number two. We have our, we have our tender. What comes next in fire building? Who's a fire builder? What comes next? I heard somebody say it a while ago. Kindling. Uh, kindling. Kindling is easily combustible small sticks or twigs used for starting a fire. Usually no more than an eighth inch to a half inch in diameter. I'll brought a little bit of that for you. I just went out in my yard last night and picked some of this stuff up. Roy asked me if, if I needed any. I said, no, i got plenty at the house. But this is some good dry kindling. I don't want to get it everywhere. But... Uh, we have some pine trees in the yard and we'll probably have a few more <laughs> limbs in the yard after today. But uh, we'll break them up and we'll have us a fire in our fire pit. But this stuff burns good. You gotta have killing. You gotta, uh, uh, if you're a fire builder, you know you take it. I ain't gonna try to do that, but you, you take it and build your little teepee over it and make your teepee bigger and get you know bigger pieces of wood. You know what I'm talking about, so you've done that before. Killing refers to the second stage of building a fire. Used to light uh, tender, uh, tenders used to light the kindling, which then lights the main fire. In referring to the fire of God kindling, and some of you may not like to say, especially if you're watching online tonight, uh, thank you, by the way, for watching. But kindling, when we refer to the fire of God kindling, are those people that I like to call fire followers. Some of you may not like this. I don't know, but I'm just, I, I just, I grew up in church, and that don't make me perfect. My Lord knows I've got my own faults. If I try to point a finger, how many fingers I got pointing back at me, you see? So I'm not pointing a finger at any particular person tonight. But I call them fire followers. And these people cannot stay still in the church or in God to move to the next level. We always want, God bless me. Will you do this for me, Lord? God, I'm ready to be used, but yet we're too busy won't we run here and there and not stay put in one place to let the Lord use us. How can Listen, let me tell, ask you something, okay? You come in here and you say, Pastor, I'm willing and ready to be used of God. You know, anywhere you can be, I can fit in. How can we expect Him to trust us to be used if we can't even stay put here? Come on. You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm getting at? And I'm, I don't see anybody in the house that's that way here tonight. But it's just it's important to see where we are at in the aspect of all four of these right here. I've heard that. Before. I'm not saying you are. I've heard that. People come in and Donnie and I, this church will be 17 years old this year. That means we've been, you know what, we just, this month, we celebrate our five year anniversary being here. Wow, that's hard to believe. We came in April five years ago. A little reluctant, but the Lord just, He did everything. I'll keep moving. <laughs> if there is a revival, these people have to go to catch the fire. And if things are happening over there, oh, well, Pastor. This church did this. And look, they're, look, they're running hundreds. That people are just coming by the droves over there. We ought to bring that back here. Well, I want to go over there and bring that fire back over here. That's the way we look. And this group, you know, uh, this group did, like I said, they, they do this in Revival Festival. So why don't we try this? Let me share another scripture with you. Now, it's true, you may need that spark to get it going. Okay? And the Lord can use a person if you go to revival not to bring in what they've got going. 
but to just bring revival, period. And he can use people like that. I agree with that but wholeheartedly. I know that where we used to go to church, when the Lakeland outpouring happened, and I believe some great things happened in that. I know a lot of people heard about the Lakeland outpouring back 10 years ago, 11 years ago now. Maybe even longer. I've done lost count on that. But uh, we had some people from our church go down. They came back, and, and you could tell our services were different, Brother Ray. They were totally different. You know, and things were happening. But at the same time, look what happens. You don't have to turn there, but in Leviticus chapter 10, very familiar passage of Scripture, at uh, verse 1 and 2, and Nadab, this King James Version here, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. Come on, work for me. There we go. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them and they died before the Lord. I do not want to be responsible for bringing a strange fire into this house. If God wants to move, He'll do it right here. He'll use us. You know, He is. Look at what's happened over the past year or two. I mean, my Lord. I don't need what's happening up the street. Nothing wrong with what's going on up there or down here. I want what's happening here. It's like I can't live on last week's anointing. I gotta have something fresh in you today. That's like eating. What I ate yesterday is long gone. I need something fresh today to eat. Don't go there. <laughs> I was waiting to laugh. The first tabernacle had been erected. Aaron had been doing a lot of sacrificing for the instructions that the Lord gave him. And one day, Aaron's sons come in, they offer incense with strange fire. And the Hebrew word for strange here means unauthorized, foreign, or profane. God didn't only, He not only rejected their sacrifice, He found it so offensive that He consumed the two men with fire. We don't know the exact nature of, of, of the fire that, that, that they used. It could have been something that they brought from the outside of the camp. It was definitely not from the altar of God where they should have gotten their fire. Or it could be that they were just so drunk that they didn't know right from wrong. We really don't know. But God, He didn't like it. He wanted... Uh, <coughs> offering the profane fire, it was a sign of their disregard for the utter holiness of God and the need to honor and obey Him in solemn and holy fear. And so I look at it from a more physical standpoint. For me to come in here and say, Pastor Donnie, John Doe, I went over to his church and revival's hitting. We need to try that. I'm bringing something strange to this house. God has given this man here and the leadership team a specific direction and, 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 and a, a, a vision. A moment blank there for a minute. Uh, one of the moments, I guess it comes with age. Uh, <laughs> anyway, he's given a specific direction and, and vision of what's going to happen in this house. And for me to come and slap him upside the face with something from another church just don't fit in. You see what I'm saying? And so I'm not saying don't go, go to this church to visit you know, to, for revivals because they're good services. I mean, you know, there's several churches around here that have revivals and the Lord moves and it's okay to go to them and get something if you feel like you need something from it. But just be careful what you do because we don't want to offer that strange fire in this house. Like kindling, offering the strange fire from another experience is not the answer. We want the power of God and the fire of God to fall but, and we want revival, but let it be what He wants for us. Let Him do what He needs to do. Alright, number three. We're getting to the good stuff here. Fuel. Actually, there's three, three types of wood for fire. There's, there, there's your tender. There's your kindling. And then there's your fuel. And there's two types of fuel. Again, I apologize for leaving this outside. I did mean to bring... I should have... If I'd have thought about it raining today, I would have brought these in last night and set inside the door. Thank you, Roy, again for bringing these for me. I asked him last week if he could find me some wood. I needed something dry. I needed something... The other one. The first of these fuels... I'll tell you, this fuel for the fire can vary in size from one inch to five inches in diameter. It can be whole logs or split down from large pieces. In building a good hot burning fire, it is important that your fuel is completely dry in order to start easily and stay lit. So with that in mind, two types of fuel. There's a well-seasoned dry wood and there's the green wet wood. Dealing with the fire of God, the first type of wood fuel is the dry seasoned wood. 
This wood burns easy. And when seasoned correctly, will burn for hours. When it begins to die out, all you have to do to keep the fire going is just throw another dry piece of wood on it. Simple enough, huh? Alan, I believe you guys burn a fire in your fireplace. Do you, do you not? You keep it going by loading it down with good dry wood. It'll stay burning all night, probably won't. Get another log thrown and you just keep repeating the process over again. In dealing with the fire of God, the well, dry, seasoned wood in the church are those saints that have been around for quite some time. They're well seasoned and grounded in the Word. They're in this race because they care for and love people. They want others to have a life-changing experience just as they have had. And when you see them, they are red glowing in the Lord just as a good burning log on the fire. And I'm not trying to blow any, you know, make any big heads in here, but when I think of well-seasoned saints in this house, I think of this couple here. I think of that great woman of God right there. All of our ministers in this church. And if I want to be in that fire, what do you think I'm going to do? I'm not going to, I'm not going to brown those by no means or, or you know... Uh, Get up under their rear end. I, I don't, there's not no easy way to say that, okay? I don't mean that rude. But don't you think if I want to get under that fresh fire and the fire of God, don't you think I'm going to come real, real elbows with this man of God right here? Don't you think I'm going to find me a man of God to help mentor me and come real elbows with him and, and get some of what they have? If I don't, I become like the Kenlin and I'll eventually burn out. <clears throat> Ladies, you can find you a, a, a good lady to, to mentor you. I, I wouldn't suggest a man or vice versa there. Uh, it's up to you, but I, I wouldn't do it. Uh, these saints want us to succeed. They want to be able to pass their heritage on to you and to me if we're younger than them. There will be a day now, I'm not that much younger than Pastor. I'm about 10 or 12 years amongst us, I guess. You're a little older. <laughs> I don't know how old Ken is, but wiser too? Okay. There'll be a day, though, when some of these older in the Lord, as the way I put it, are not going to be around. And I need to get from them what I can while they're here. And we need to be that way in order to stay lit and under the fire of God and see the fire fall. And it's not going to fall the same. Pastor Donnie may jump and shout and spit and sputter and, and speak in tongues and do everything else. Brother John Dover here may not be quite so excited, but he still loves the Lord and he's, you know, and he, he lets the Spirit move and stuff. We're not all the same. And we're not trying to do that, but we do want to pass our hair to John. And that's why I can say I'm a fifth generation Pentecostal. I'm not knocking any other denomination, but it's just all I know. Just like people say, well, I grew up a Baptist. I'm a fifth generation Baptist. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, be a good Baptist. Be a good Presbyterian. <laughs> I'm picking on Alan because that came out here a while back. But, I mean, you know, whatever you grew up, be good at what, you, what you've done. There's nothing wrong with it. You know what matters to me when it comes to the different denominations is what's being preached out of this book. That's what matters. And you can have... Uh, God-fearing, Bible-believing, Bible-teaching Presbyterians. You can have God-fearing, Bible-believing, Bible-teaching Pentecostals. It doesn't matter as long as this is being taught and we're learning what we need to know. It doesn't matter if you speak in tongues or not. The Bible tells me all I need to have is Jesus in my heart. All everything else is just added benefits and, and gifts. And I told Ray when we were talking earlier, I said, you know, if I have a, a $20 bill and I throw it on the floor or, or I just say, uh, you know... Uh, Ray, I, you want this? It's yours if you'd like to have it. And that's what God does with all these different things and the gifts of the Spirit. He says they're here for the taking if you want them. You don't have to have them, but they're there if you want them. And I want to get everything I can. I just want every bit that I can. Maybe I don't know. Maybe I don't have to get the interpretation, or maybe the Lord had moved on me to to get a message out in tongues like we had today. And there's nothing wrong with that. We just need to be used where we're comfortable at and where we know He's put us at. And that's where the different levels come in. If you go running from church to church trying to find this fire and that fire, and and the God's moving over here, how do you expect to move to the the next level? 
It goes back to being kindling. So, but anyway, the well-seasoned wood are the well-seasoned saints. Let me read this. The, this everybody knows this song, and I don't want to try to sing it because I've heard it, but don't really know how it goes all the way. Remember this verse right here, this old song. It only takes a spark to get a fire going. And soon all those around can warm up to its glowing. That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, you spread His love to everyone. You want to pass it on. And that's the way I want it from a well-seasoned saint. I want them to be able to, what they have received, you to be able to pass it on to me so that when the time comes for me, God forbid, uh, if I'm here that long, if He comes back, that's fine. But if I'm here that long, I want to be able to pass it on to those behind me as well. Now, one more wood and we're done. Ray, I may beat your time after all. I don't know. The other side of this wood fuel is green wood. This is a piece of white pine. I don't want to touch it too much. I think of that movie Chevy Chase is in. What is it? Uh, Christmas vacation. Where they get the Christmas tree and he's... <laughs> Lost happen here. <laughs> Oh, Lord. There are two distinct, and we're talking about the green wet wood right here now. Okay, on the end. There are two distinct characteristics of this type of wood that stand out. If you've ever, and I know everyone in here has. You throw a piece of green wood on a fire, it's going to spit and hiss making a lot of noise. Noise to only be heard. It'll also put off a lot of smoke just so it can be seen. So in dealing with the fire of God in the church, this type of wood or these type of people, green wood are those that only work to be seen and heard. You notice them in church all around. They sound off about what they've done. Hey, I, I missed you yesterday. I was here at the food bank. I helped give out food to over 50 families. Ain't God good? You didn't do a thing. God did it all. I ministered at First Christian Church last week and I prayed for five people and they were healed. When I prayed for one gentleman, he got saved. Where's God in that? Why didn't you give the glory to God instead of you? Because you didn't do it. I did this. Oh, I did that over here. My favorite for me, okay? And I'm speaking about me from 25 years ago. This was my thing for me. Because I'll make it a little personal just so you don't think I'm picking anyone. I'll pick on myself. I'm a youth pastor, minister of music. I have 25 to 30 in my youth group and I have about 25 in my church choir. Good Lord, look at that. Big deal. Because without God, it's just, I think, you know, if we just came in here and did our thing and didn't let the Lord have His way, yeah, the Lord would still get a little honor and glory out of it, but at the same time, I believe He'd look at it and just go, Because I believe, like, like we were worshiping here today, we were just loving on the Lord. And you know, when we were doing that, I honestly believe that the Lord looks at that like a flower and goes, mm, that smells so good, that's my people loving on me. I believe that's the way He is. I am going to need my glasses because I didn't put this one in here. Matthew chapter 6. You don't have to turn there unless you want to. I added this later. <laughs> Concerning being seen. God makes it very clear at how He'll be. Forgive me, I forgot. I should have had this together. I, I, I forgot. I wrote it in there and it didn't have my Bible set for that. If you want to turn there, find the chapter, chapter 6 of Matthew, starting in verse 5. He says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. 
But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. If you look on down to verse 16, Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a, a, a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. In other words, they want to be seen. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which uh, seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. It's plain and simple. Right there. I don't want to make a lot of noise. I used to be that way. I was telling somebody, I think I was telling Colin yesterday, maybe it was. Um, when I youth pastored in, 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 in uh, Georgetown, when I was talking about right here, I had about 25, 30 my youth group. I did. I had about 25 in my choir. And Ray, I thought I was something. 21 years old, and look at me, I had got it made. Look at me. Me, me, me. I, was, I leaned over at Gail Day and said, I hope he don't go too far because he's st starting to step into what I was going to talk about tonight. Pastor mentioned that today. <coughs> me, I, it's all about me. Look at what I did. And it wasn't until almost I had been there about a year and the associate pastor's wife come, but she ringed me over the coals good. And she put me in my place. It ain't your youth group. It ain't your choir. You're here to serve the Lord and you need to do what He wants instead of what you want. I mean, I felt about this big by the time she got done. But you know, I love that lady today. She would never know the impact she had on my life just by pointing her finger in my face. She wasn't really in my face, but I mean, by basically pointing her finger in my face and saying, you better get it right, young man. Because it ain't right now. It ain't about me. I want to love people. I just want to do what He wants. And I've told you this before. I never knew how to love people until I came here. And it's not lifting this man and woman up. But I never knew how to love people until I came here. Never been taught. You just do your thing. I don't want to be in a green piece of wood, I'll tell you that. We have a tendency to brag on ourselves when we're green wood. Far too often rather than give the Lord the honor and glory. And like Greenwood spitting and making a lot of noise, we speak out of our mouths about what we've done. We want to make sure we are seen just like that Greenwood puts off so much smoke. I challenge you tonight on that. If you feel like you're in that place, it's none of my business on that. I'm, just, I'm here just letting you see the different types of wood and you and I fit in one of these four categories. I hope that we're all right here I don't know that. I want to be at a place that all that I need to do is just do what He wants me to do and let Him do what's needed after that. Because it's not about me at all. And when I get up here on Sundays, I just want the Lord to have His way. I want to be hid behind that cross so that the only thing people see is they don't see me but they see Jesus and Him crucified. So that when we enter into worship, the Lord gets to do what He wants to do rather than what I want to do. Or Donnie. Or Ray. Or Ken. Or Belinda. Or anybody else. We do one more scripture and I'm closing, I promise. <laughs> told Ray today at the table there's was that two? Oh, I got a third one? Okay, all right. Maybe four? I told
told Ray Lee, you know, any true preacher, they, they never get done the first time. In closing, that's one. I'm getting ready to close. That's number two. Finally, my brethren, he's probably from about there at that point. <laughs> Our old preacher, you say, how many give me five more minutes? I got plenty of time now. <laughs> I do want to read this scripture, and I've shared it with you many times. But I think it's fitting to the fact that when I first started in ministry, Brother Ray, I got my start scrubbing toilets. I cut grass. Boy. I washed pots and pans that were used to feed 200 plus people three times a day. I'd take an old beat up Ford pickup truck and load it to the gills with trash and go five miles up the road to the dump to dump it off the dump and come back and do that twice a day. And it wasn't until I, somebody read this that I realized that what I was doing had just as much impact as the evangelist behind the pulpit in the evening services or during morning chapel. Matthew chapter 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, your Bible, your version may say a denarius, uh, it was a day's wage. Uh, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. See, he doesn't change it after that. Whatsoever is right. He didn't say I give you days. Well, he said whatsoever is right. And they went their way. And again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So and let me just stop here real quick. And I've said this before that put it in today's standards. I work about ten miles from my office. And if my boss calls me and says, Stanley, did you come work for an hour? Well, what if I'm out in the yard doing yard work? I got to get a shower. I ain't going to go to the office stinking and sweating. Well, I sweat here, but I was clean when I got here this morning. <laughs> but I'm going to have to get a shower, get changed, get my truck, crank it up, go 10 miles up the road. For one hour's pay. And then come back home. Does that sound kind of fair? How many would seriously do that? You wouldn't want to. Not one person raised their hand here. I wouldn't want to do that. But this landowner, he goes out and says, get out there and help bring this harvest in. Boy, there's a lot to be done. Get out there. He didn't say, I'll pay you an hour's wage. He said, I'll pay you what it's worth. And then when they go, if you read on, I'm not going to go into that, but when you read on, he gave every single one of them a day's wage, a penny, a denarius. Because he saw they did, his, they did just good work just like the guys. But what I saw in that, what I see out of that is the fact that Sister Dana mentioned this uh, a long time ago. Um, I gave my piece of paper away. You wanted to write it down and give it to me yes and put it in my Bible. How do you feel when you're called a servant? Just who gets me humble, unworthy. These guys at that last hour could have cared less about that pay because really, in, in, when you put it in, in a physical sense, it wasn't worth it. But they saw there was a great need. And they saw that the harvest needed to be brought in. And so to me, it became more of an act of servitude and getting the job done versus I need the money. That's the way we need to look at it. So I want to leave you with that. So where do you fit in here? If we light you on fire, spiritual sense, are you going to be like this and burn up within just maybe a minute? Maybe it'll last a little longer. Maybe you'll put off some smoke and sizzle and spit a little bit at us. Or will you burn hefty, long, 
glowing fire. Then they're the best type of fires. Once that, once those flames go down, man, you can warm any part of your body you need to around that hot glowing log. This is where I want to be. And I challenge you, if you're not there,